Unpredictable weather patterns are becoming more frequent and intense from water scarcity, scarcity in rural communities to flooding in major cities. The country's environmental and socio-economic vulnerabilities are under pressure. This morning, we delve deep into climate change and its impact on South Africa's weather patterns. Joining us now to unpack this is the director for the School of Climate Studies at the Stellenbosch University, Professor Guy Midgley. Prof, a very good morning to you. Thank you so much for making time for us this morning. Before we start the conversation around climate change, I just quickly want to um, go back to a conversation that we had a bit earlier on um, with the South Africa Weather Service Senior Forecaster, Dukelo Chirwane. And this is with regards to early warning systems and also technology that is available um, to help also in determining the extent of the damage that could be caused by the severe flooding. And she says, yes, there is technology available, but not readily available to the South African Weather Service. What sort of technology are we talking about here? Well, it's a great question. Thanks for having me, by the way. Um, serious times. You know, there's actually a, a web of technologies uh, that is available, things like radar, uh, things like um, high-level uh, satellite and uh, weather balloon data information. Uh, but also being able to tap into an international network <clears throat> is absolutely vital. So if we share our weather data with, say, the World Meteorological Organization, it can lead to uh, an increase in the value of that information because it's integrated. So there's actually, uh, as I say, a wide range of technologies that we could be tapping into more effectively. And there's no real reason why we shouldn't be doing so. Weather data are important for everybody. It's a public good and it should be made available for free uh, because we as taxpayers fund the weather services and the treasury should fund weather services because the return on that investment is a multiple of the investment can be four four to five times and if integrated into international systems can be up to 20 times the return so it makes no sense not to fund weather services and let them do their job yeah was that this an issue uh, quickly prof that was ever raised with government around the funding of the south african weather service well, we've uh, we've done a we have done some reports uh, for uh, for for government on that. We're working with the World Bank, looking at the cost uh, and the return on investment, um, the economics of it, and uh, you know it would be useful for science and the scientists to have a chance, have an audience with Treasury to be able to make that argument one on one, because uh, very often I think Treasury looks thinks about austerity and limiting spending without thinking about what's the value of actually spending and the return you get, which makes us all wealthier. Yeah, and I guess also the ability to uh, what your quickest response going to be if you know the, the true extent of the damage that could be caused because then you're able to avoid repairing, for instance, some of the infrastructure and avoid the loss of life. Avoiding loss of life, that's number one. Uh, and then avoiding damage to infrastructure. Early Early warnings pay back millions, tens of millions of rands, even more. All right. Prof, let's now go into the conversation around uh, climate change. Multiple cut of lows that uh, we have been told about, especially during this particular period. What is happening? Why are we seeing this particular change? And I remember the other time when we were having conversation with uh, one of the meteorologists from SA Weather saying that... Um, uh, Somebody had asked him, like, when is the cold weather coming? When is the cold weather coming? And he said, well, here is the cold weather. That, but that was already in June. Um, is there a reason why there was a delay, for instance, in the cold weather as well? It's an incredibly important question. And it, it makes a point that I've been trying to make for some while, hopefully making some traction. The focus on climate change in my opinion, has been too far into the future. So we're looking at 2050, 2040, 2080. What's the, what's the climate going to be like? I think it's much more important for Southern Africa to know how climate change is affecting extreme events and the variability of weather, because there's an interaction between those things. We are much more affected by variability, by El Nino conditions, La Nina conditions. And the research in the climate change space has really been focused on the medium to long term. And I think it has left us a little bit in the lurch because it would be far better for us 
in terms of return on investment to understand the variability issues. And uh, South Africa needs a climate science research strategy that combines all the universities and the weather services in a mutual effort to understand this. I would strongly advocate for that. I would, uh, yeah, I'm trying to talk to members of the Presidential Climate Commission about it uh, to try and drive that agenda because we, we, we're we running out of time. We have to get this right uh, much quicker and we have the capability of doing it. Yeah. So is this what we're currently experiencing, the impact of climate change? It is a combination of climate variability and climate change. Okay. As is always the case. And it is, it is a greater, um, really greater energy levels in the atmosphere which are driving these more extreme events and these cutoff lows, which, which you don't fully understand why. If we could understand why, we could predict them better. And are they going to go away or are they going to get worse? Incredibly important for us to understand this. Yeah. Uh, so a delay, for instance, in the cold temperatures landing in South Africa, what does that then mean for the seasons and how we understand the seasons? And specifically also here speaking then about uh, the impact that some of these changes in weather patterns could have on um, the South Africa's food security, especially for agricultural sector. Massively important for agriculture and food security. South Africa is one of the few countries on the continent that it generates excess calories, so we need to protect that. But uh, what we're seeing uh, largely is a result of a hugely increased energy content in the, in the ocean. So the ocean temperatures have gone up a lot. And um, I'm not sure exactly how this all works, but it looks as though we're getting a much more steep decline into temperatures, into the low temperatures of winter. So the autumn, the, uh, the, the late autumn, seems to be staying warmer for longer, and then we suddenly decline into winter conditions with these cutoff lows. That's a really, it can be very damaging because your agricultural stock have not acclimated to cooling temperatures, and then suddenly they hit you after fairly warm temperatures. And that can be very dangerous. It lures, you know, people get a false sense of a warm, warm environment, and then suddenly they're hit with these super, super cold temperatures. And uh, these, this is a kind of a I wouldn't say it's a totally new thing, but it seems to be happening more frequently. It happened last year as well. We had a sort of late autumn, and then suddenly we hit it, we hit winter, and it catches people off guard. Yeah. Uh, could that be destructive, though? It's hugely destructive. I mean, you look at uh, flooding in Amtata, and the high wind speeds that were associated with the cutoff low in, in, the, in the Eastern Cape and up into KZN, um, this, this overwhelms the capacity of drainage systems in small towns, mm. which are really staggering a little bit uh, and under uh, you know, their ability to, to meet the service delivery requirements. It stretches our budgets. It stretches the skills and capacity of people there. We've urgently got to work with Salga. I had a very interesting workshop, uh, a climate and law workshop uh, yesterday and the day before here at Stellenbosch with uh, Salga representatives and the legal people here at Stellenbosch to, to try and understand how local government can adapt to climate change and listening to the challenges that they face. We've got to listen and learn and help at the same time. This is a mutual relationship and we had a fantastic workshop. So we're really working on trying to figure out how to better use our science to, to support. Yeah, and earlier this year, for instance, we also saw a lot and lots of rain. I think it was March and April as well where people said that ordinarily you wouldn't be experiencing um, um, so much rain. And now as well, it's um, the height of the winter season. Uh, we normally would get rain in the Western Cape, but now you also have um, rain and thunderstorms being experienced in parts like uh, the Eastern Cape. Yeah, absolutely. And, we, and, you know, we can turn that to our advantage. Instead of it hitting us negatively all the time, if we could store that water if we could, uh, we could find ways to turn that to our advantage, it could be so much better for us. And we could do so, but it does need the collaboration, cooperation of science, mm. uh, policymakers, and implementers on the ground. We've got to give them confidence in their jobs. We've got to stop coming down hard on local government officials for being unable to meet audit requirements, etc. We need to turn the question around and say, how can we help you to deliver? I, I think we've got to get a lot more creative and a lot more... Yeah positive 
about these issues. We have the local government elections that are coming up um, next year. And my experience with previous elections, whether it is the general elections or the local government elections, is that there's not a lot of emphasize, uh, emphasis um, around the impact of climate change. Um, do you think that this moment calls for a rethink around how politicians, lawmakers think about climate change? Look, South African politics <clears throat> is an ideological game, and ideology is extremely dangerous for a country that is facing risks like this. Um, <clears throat> we've seen what happened in Russia with ideology driving uh, essentially you know, a virtual collapse of the country because of some crazy ideas at the top. So uh, my, you know, my opinion is that we should, we should really be looking at what people need um, and how to make their lives better. We've got money to do it. We have a fiscus. We have a responsibility, and we should stop playing political games. Of course, the parties uh, are always looking to their own, you know, to, to persisting and, and growing their influence. But the voters can really show where their interests lie, and so we should do so. And if parties can pick up on the environmental security, environmental safety, and show that they they favor that, I think it should be beneficial and uh, it's going to be better for everybody. Thank you so much for your time. Um, Professor Mike, uh, sorry, Guy Mitchley there uh, from the Stellenbosch University um, School of Climate Studies on the climate change and some of the variabilities that we are currently experiencing in the country. And also from a political side as well, I don't know if you've looked at the manifestos of the various political parties um, and have you seen an emphasis though around the climate change and the impact of climate change.